Don't tell me they don't use money in the 23rd century. Well, they don't. The economics of the future are somewhat different. The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. What does that mean exactly? It means... It means we don't need money. This is something Star Trek writers and fans have been grappling with for decades. How does Star Trek's future society work? A world without money seems alien to the point of impossibility to many people. The difficulty in answering this question has led to numerous fan theories, essays, non-fiction books, and even some dismissals. It's a nice idea, but it can never happen, says the straw man. This was also something foremost in my mind when I was making part two of my Philosophy of Star Trek series on the concept of utopia. I thought about including the topic of today's video as a segment in that video, but I ultimately couldn't find a place for it. So here is my two cents on the subject. It's based on what we've seen and heard in the Star Trek mythos, combined with my extrapolations and ideas to fill in the blanks. A fun thought experiment to try and answer this age-old question, how does Star Trek's future work? To tackle this question, we have to look at replicators. Warp drive is often pinpointed as the threshold technology in Star Trek's universe. However, I think this emphasis on warp drive downplays the massive impact of the invention of replicators. Warp drive and first contact may have altered humanity's collective worldview, but replicators are what truly transformed human society into the post-scarcity utopia seen in the mythos. In our modern world, we need money to meet our basic needs. Our motivation in making money is so we can continue to shelter, clothe, and feed ourselves. There are other goods and services we use money for, but our basic needs come first. The mere existence of replicators, then, outright eliminates our primary need for money. Replicators can meet all of our basic needs, as well as luxury items right off the bat. So why would we ever need money? This is a rather obvious point to anyone who has ever entertained the question at the heart of this video, but the implications of replicator technology go further than that. Replicators can be used to meet our basic needs, but I have yet to see anyone recognize replicators are also the ultimate tools for self-sufficiency. Keep in mind that not only can replicators replicate goods, but they can also replicate other replicators. Not only that, but replicators can replicate power sources. Replicators can make solar panels, batteries, or even the components of a small fusion reactor. Replicators can also provide building materials like bricks, cement, or lumber. They can even replicate parts for furniture, heaters, and any other creature comfort needed to make a cozy home. With a single replicator, one could become completely self-sufficient. You can build a house and meet all your basic needs without even connecting your home to any kind of grid. You wouldn't even need pipes for running water or sewage removal if you didn't want to. You can get water from the replicator and dispose of any waste by placing it inside the replicator. Now, in Star Trek, we've heard of industrial replicators. These are certainly handy for getting large-scale production or colony efforts up and running relatively quickly, but on an individual level, a single modestly-sized replicator is all anyone would need. When it comes to powering a replicator, the primary method of energy generation in Star Trek's future seems to be fusion power. Although the warp drive on most starships is powered by a matter-antimatter reactor, all other systems seem to be powered by fusion. Now, fusion does require fuel, but once a replicator is powered up, the fuel needed for fusion is now in infinite supply, because the replicator itself can make more of it. It would make sense for there to be some kind of central organization or authority to initially create and distribute replicator technology, but once replicators see mass adoption, no one needs to rely on that central organization anymore. A single replicator gives a household the means to live completely independently, as much on or off the grid as it likes. The moment replicator technology is invented, our modern ideas of market supply and demand and so on cease to have any relevance whatsoever. Money doesn't exist in Star Trek's future because it no longer serves any function. But if replicators can make anything anyone could ever want, how come people still give gifts? How come people still go to restaurants? How do people own property? Let's tackle the first question. Throughout Star Trek, we've seen numerous characters exchange gifts. 
Bones gave Kirk a pair of antique reading glasses, Picard gave Data the complete works of Shakespeare, and Jake gave his dad a valuable baseball card. All of these things can just be made in replicators, can't they? So why do they have any value? Gifts don't just serve practical purposes, they function as symbols of a relationship. Get a gift from you, sir. You value it? Yes, sir. Why? It is a reminder of friendship and service. There's also the concept of strict uniqueness to consider. Sisko could have at any time replicated himself a baseball card. While it would have looked exactly like the card he wanted, it wouldn't have as much value as the one Jake gifted him, because the replicated card wouldn't be unique. The baseball card Jake found is an antique, it has a history which a replicated version wouldn't possess. And just like the example of Picard gifting Data the works of Shakespeare, the baseball card becomes a tangible symbol of Jake and Sisko's relationship as father and son. Well, can't you just replicate another one? We could. Yeah, but we're not going to. That's our dartboard and we want it back. It's the principle of the thing. Mm. The idea that the existence of replicators would somehow render gifts redundant is predicated on the notion of gifts only having value if they are exchanged for money or if they serve some practical purpose. However, this fails to consider the social value of gift giving and the sentimental value of collector's items. The same thing applies to restaurants. People go to restaurants in Star Trek for the same reason people go to restaurants today. Partly for a higher food quality, but I would argue mostly for the experience. Human beings are social creatures. We like to be amongst other people, even if we're not actively interacting with everyone. A good dining experience isn't wholly dependent on the food and drink, but the atmosphere of a place, the decor, the character, the music, and so on. People in Star Trek go to restaurants simply because they like it, because they can't get the experience of a restaurant, bar, or cafe from a replicator at home. Which leads us to another question. If there is no commerce, how do people own things? How does Joseph Sisko own his restaurant? How does the Picard family own Chateau Picard? It's conceivable they could have been built from replicated materials, but there are repeated references to both properties being in both families for generations. First, we need to distinguish private property from personal property. Private property is something one claims ownership of for profit, whereas personal property is something one claims ownership of for personal use. My PlayStation is personal property because I use it. If it was stolen, I wouldn't just be hurt financially, but I would also be hurt personally, because I wouldn't be able to finish Yakuza Like a Dragon, and I was really doing well in that business management minigame. This is why we intrinsically understand that theft is wrong. It's not just because the law says so, there's also a social contract at work. Ian e M. Banks' culture series also depicts a future utopian society where money and the concept of private property don't exist, and we see this social contract in practice. In the book The Player of Games, the protagonist, Jernau Morat Gergé, yeah, all of Ian e. M. Banks' character names were like this, spends almost five years away from his home on an expedition to an alien empire. During his time away, his home is freely used by other people, because they know he will not be personally using the property while he's away. By the time he returns from his mission, the house is returned to him, because it's understood he'll be living there again until further notice. Considering the age of these properties, it's possible the circumstances of their ownership were grandfathered into this new moneyless society, but even if money can't buy property in the future, there's still that social contract. The Picard and Sisko families both personally use these properties. The Picards make wine and Joseph Sisko serves customers. We all understand intrinsically that if someone broke in and claimed ownership of either property against the wishes of the Picards or Siskos, both families would suffer personal harm. Therefore, although neither property is privately owned, we understand they are the personal properties of the Picards and Siskos. But if no one earns any money, then why would anyone work at Chateau Picard or at Siskos? In fact, if no one needs any money, why would anyone work at all? As we all know, in our current world we all need money, and the primary way of getting money is through work. However, it's a mistake to assume that getting money is the only reason people work. A future without money where basic needs are met wouldn't eliminate work. It would simply eliminate work people didn't want to do. It would eliminate the kinds of pointless jobs described in David Graeber's book Bullshit Jobs. 
This is why, in my opinion, a failure of Star Trek's world building is the strange absence of automation. Joseph Sisko clearly loves running his restaurant. He enjoys the process of preparing food for people and always greets customers with a big smile on his face. In today's world, Sisko would have to constantly worry about the restaurant being profitable, but in Star Trek's future, he can simply do the work which makes him happy without ever stressing about money. But is the guy spending eight hours a day welding hull panels onto the Enterprise really fulfilled by that kind of work? Then again, some work is worth doing even if one doesn't enjoy it, simply because it can be a positive act. Jake doesn't like waiting tables or helping out in the kitchen in his grandfather's restaurant, but he still does the work because helping his grandpa out is a good thing to do. So we could argue menial construction jobs have become communal jobs, which everyone does at some point in their lives in Star Trek's future, but personally I'm not convinced. This is one of the gaps in Star Trek's world building which I'm choosing to fill in with my own headcanon. The point is that work isn't just about earning money, it's about finding something to do that's fulfilling on a personal level. As a piece of anecdotal evidence, I've occasionally asked my friends and family what they would do with their lives if they didn't have to worry about money. Not one person has ever said they'd just sit on the couch and watch The Office again for the one millionth time. Everyone has said things like, I'd learn an instrument, I'd learn a language, I'd go back to school and study a science, I'd travel the world, I'd finally sit down and write that novel. What this shows to me is that when money is no object, people want to learn, to express themselves and do something exciting. People would still do what we would consider work due to the labour involved, they would simply do the work that they would find most fulfilling. In Star Trek's moneyless future, replicators not only take care of our basic needs, but they also make us totally self-sufficient. Our possessions are neither communal nor private, but personally owned, something which is understood via social contract. This leaves us free to pursue the work which is truly fulfilling to us on a deeper level. There is no theft because no one is driven to desperation through poverty, and no valuable item can be sold off. But how can a social contract settle disputes? What about housing? What about infrastructure? What about the government? What about the bad apples? There are still a lot of lingering questions about how Star Trek's future works. Originally, I attempted to answer all of them in a single video, but the project proved to be too big in the time I had. Therefore, I've decided to make this into a series of videos. We've covered money, work and property in this video, and the next will focus on how Star Trek's future society is organised. If you want to know when that video drops, subscribe to the channel and make sure to hit the bell icon. When that video is finished, you'll be able to see it early over on my Patreon page, where you can also find exclusive commentaries and video essays. For now though, I'll simply say thank you for watching, and thank you to all of my patrons and members whose names are currently scrolling by. I'd also like to say an ultra thanks to Hiroshi the Dog, Movie Magic, Charles Borsum, Olivia Computer, Bano, Dent the Air, Extreme Streamers, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and Kajing G. Until next time, have a good one guys, live long and prosper.